This is Hungry Horse Dam in northwestern Montana, the product of human engineering. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. Man-made lakes created to supply energy and water, critical in times of drought like this, benefit people. But often, they're a mixed blessing for wildlife. There are more man-made lakes in the United States than in any other country in the world. Surprisingly, however, one of the greatest and most important is in southern Africa, Lake Kariba. Its story began 30 years ago. Zimbabwe was then colonial Rhodesia. The great Zambezi River flowed unimpeded to form part of the country's northern border. But in 1959, Kariba Dam was completed and the Zambezi was changed forever. 2,500 square miles of river valley were flooded, creating one of the largest man-made lakes in the world. It was in one last fling of empire building that plans were made to dam the mighty Zambezi. Civil engineers defied the local gods and created a lake so immense that it made a permanent dent in the surface of the earth. At that time, it was the largest man-made body of water on the planet. Our story begins here, where the Zambezi shows its true muscle. At the height of the rainy season, 120 million gallons of water a minute are flung over a cliff more than a mile wide, a waterfall judged the eighth wonder of the world. The local people call it Mozi Ayatunya, the smoke that thunders. The smoke that thunders was brought to Western notice in 1885 by this hero of African exploration, the missionary Dr. David Livingston. At first, Livingston didn't seem very impressed by the falls. He grossly underestimated their height and their width. But he did realize that they would capture public imagination and promote further exploration. Ignoring the fact that the Arabs and the Portuguese had been there centuries before, he discovered the Zambezi River and the mighty waterfall for the British. named them Victoria Falls after his queen, and thus began the colonial process that eventually would lead to the transformation of a valley into a shimmering inland sea. As pictures painted at the time reflect, Livingston believed he had discovered a lost Eden. He thought the friendly local natives would be docile converts to his Christian faith and avid customers for the goods British traders would bring down this new waterway to the ivory-rich heart of Africa. It was a Victorian fantasy. But Livingston stubbornly refused to accept this, even when it became evident that the gentle natives were slave raiders who welcomed Livingston because his guns gave them advantage over their main rivals in another tribe. 
the Zambezi became a road to martyrdom for the missionaries that came after. The natives were not docile, and the river itself proved unnavigable, blocked by treacherous rapids. Nevertheless, by the turn of the century, a British colony, Rhodesia, was thriving and enthusiastically bringing the 20th century to the heart of Africa. The colonialists believed that hydroelectric power would fuel the modernization of Central Africa. What it might do to the life and character of the valley was not fully considered. Engineers carefully surveyed the Zambezi and decided to dam it here in a narrow rock gorge called Kariba. As construction began, animals moved away from the disturbance. Crocodiles, however, moved in to prey on the workers. A massive campaign to wipe them out was initiated. And because the lake behind the dam was intended to provide a lucrative new fishing industry, massive bulldozers stormed through the bush, towing ships' anchor chains to remove trees that could snag the fishing nets. This was progress at its most uncompromising. Conservationists predicted ecological disaster, but their voices were few. The best they could do was to make contingency plans for the aftermath of the destruction. The resident people suffered too. They lost their homeland along the river. The Batanka, a small tribe, actually did fit Livingston's concept of the peaceful inhabitants of Eden. They were trucked away from the familiar river that was the foundation of their culture and livelihood and dumped on high, dry ground. The Batanka had never seen machines that could literally move the earth, nor could they imagine that engineers would be able to strangle their river, which they worshipped as a god, Niami Niami. When it became clear that this was indeed the intention, the Batanka waited calmly for Niami Niami's angry response. It came in the early months of 1958. A temporary coffer dam had just been completed when reports reached Kariba of a slow, inexorable buildup of water upstream. Within days, the Zambezi was running at levels never before recorded, a chocolate brown maelstrom which quickly turned its fury on the coffer dam. Soon, the river was running 61 feet above any previously recorded level.
Had the planners suspected that the Zambezi would produce so much water, they might have reconsidered whether or not the Great River could ever be dammed. Inevitably, the Aminiami's full wrath swept over the concrete coffer dam in a tidal wave 156 feet high. After destroying the dam, it then engulfed the bridges. Three and a half million gallons a second rampaged through the gorge. The only smiles could have been those of the Batanka, thankful, perhaps for the only time, for their vantage point on high ground. But that was it. Niami Niami had done his worst. Within months, the disaster of the flood had been overcome, and the huge buckets were at work again, each containing 22 tons of concrete, the sand and stone of neighboring hillsides. A million tons of sand and 600,000 tons of granite were used. Everything had been won back from the Zambezi, and always the buckets came and went, and the wall climbed steadily towards its full 420 feet. Already the next stage was in sight as they planned to close the arches in the northern section. Here the last move would be made, and the Zambezi checked meeting. By Kariba standards, this was a small operation, yet they had the Zambezi by the throat at last. It halted and slowly began to back up above the dam. December 1958, and the battle was won. For conservationists, it was a moment of relief. The worst of the devastation seemed to be over. Time just might heal the wound. But as the water slowly backed up behind the dam, it quickly became evident that thousands of wild animals were trapped on ever-shrinking islands. A massive rescue swung into action, Operation Noah.
This was the first time such a large-scale translocation of wild animals had been attempted. A government film unit documented the unprecedented operation. Their remarkable film footage, forgotten for 30 years, was rediscovered during the making of this program for nature. Apart from Noah's biblical exploit, nothing like this had ever been attempted before. It was a case of learning on the job. Little was known about the effects of stress on captured animals. In some species, the mortality was high. Some animals had to be dug out before their underground burrows became watery graves. Others were chased down. The rifle is loaded with a tranquilizer dart. Operation Noah pioneered the use of tranquilizers, essential in capturing and handling large animals. Fear of overdosing sometimes led to underdosing, which made a dangerous job all the more difficult. For four years, as the lake slowly filled, the rescue continued. Without the benefit of heavy machinery, it was back-breaking work accomplished by stamina and dedication. The animals were released into the newly established park along the shore of the lake. Yeah, <laughs> 
This rhino doesn't seem very grateful to his rescuers, unless, of course, he's helping to push the boat out. It was found that captured animals often suffered violent rises in temperature. When released, they lay exhausted and apparently unable to move. Releasing the animals close to the shore enabled them to cool down and recover in the water before they made off into their new territory. As the water continued to rise and the last islands vanished, Operation Noah made a last desperate effort to pluck struggling survivors from the water before they were overcome by exhaustion. It soon became clear that different animals had very different swimming capabilities. But even a relatively strong swimmer like a leopard which could manage one and a half miles, would never make the 12 miles to shore. A vervet monkey is a poor swimmer and could only struggle about 200 yards. This phenomenal four-year effort saved only a minority of animals, but Operation Noah remains a testament to Zimbabwe's concern for the welfare of its wildlife. Its last act was to set up an orphanage. Thank you. 
For those still working on the dam, the beginning of the end was marked by a cheerful little ceremony on June the 22nd, 1959. Sir Roy Walensky, Prime Minister of the Federation, poured the last bucket of concrete to complete the main wall, two years, seven months, and 16 days after his predecessor, Lord Malvern, had poured the first. sort of tidying up process had begun. By treaty, an agreed amount of water had to flow through the river to Mozambique. They opened temporary outlets to supply this until the whole scheme was working and the tail races feeding the water back. The second copper dam, once dominating the scene but now hardly noticeable, was cleared up. four-lane highway was laid across the top of the dam wall and finished by May 1960. The god of the river, Niami Niami, apparently viewed all this good work with approval. It had provided some employment for the Batanka people, but he was still less than happy with the mighty dam. As the turbines finally began to produce electricity, he waved his magic wand again, and a strange plant began to advance across the lake. At least that was the way the Batanka saw it. Local botanists decided that the newly formed lake, spreading out over the uprooted dead vegetation, was as rich in nutrients as vegetable soup, and the weed was thriving in these unique conditions. For a time, there was a theory that the weed came from the garden of a mission station in the valley, now deep underwater. The wrath of another god, perhaps? The weed was, in fact, Salvinia, an import from South America. How it got to Africa was never discovered, and it was soon posing real problems. It grew so thickly you could lie and, in places, walk on it. Propeller-driven boats had to be towed through this new aquatic jungle, and even young trees began to take up residence on the floating mat. It began to accumulate behind the mighty generators, threatening to clog vital inlets. Just when the Kariba engineers were ready to hit the panic button and launch bombing runs with lethal herbicides, it was noticed that the wave action of the settling lake appeared to set natural limits on the weed. Since then, as the lake has become an established waterway, the weed problem has receded. Today, after several years of drought, it's merely a curiosity. Thirty years later, only the bare bones of drowned trees recall the troubled years of the lake's creation. The lake was stocked with a cash crop fish, Capenta, from Lake Tanganyika, creating an industry that today is worth $25 million a year. In a glistening Kariba sunset, boats set out for an evening's work. Yeah, 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 yeah
The Mopani trees in the shallows were expected to rot, but they proved to be such useful perches for the flocks of birds attracted to these rich waters that they're literally fossilizing under the deposits of bird droppings. The Mopani serves as an ideal perch for a kingfisher looking for fish and an African darter basking in the sun. Fish eagles, relatives of our own bald eagle, ring the shores of Lake Kariba finding the lake a natural bonanza. Egrets wade in the shallows of the shoreline. A male weaver bird is building his nest, hoping to attract a female. The entrance at the bottom is a precaution against predators. Choosing particular grasses, he fashions an intricate hanging structure. For birds of passage, the new lake was a vast oasis halfway down their migratory route. After the long, dry stretches of North Africa, Kariba, with its burgeoning fish life, became a bird haven of increasing importance. There has been an unexplained drop in numbers in recent years, though, and there's now concern that an excessive use of DDT pesticides, which cause eggshell thinning, may be affecting reproduction. But for most species of wildlife, such as this water buck, the lush pastures fringing the lake provide a permanent resource. Extraordinary pockets of game have built up. This is the sable antelope, a very rare animal in most parts of Africa. They're normally seen in ones or twos. A group this large is unusual, and herds of up to 60 have been seen in these parts.
As the animals of the Zambezi Valley grew accustomed to their new habitat, subtle changes occurred in their behavior. Away from the lake, the valley can be desert dry and hot in the Central African summer, and the river reduced to a slow stream joining tepid pools. Animals accustomed to dry conditions once guarded and fought over water. Here, they live in easy proximity, sharing the great abundance. These are not water buffalo, but a kind of cape buffalo, which normally browse grass and mopani trees on the dry savanna. At Kariba, they often spend as much time in the water as on land, grazing on the weed at the edge of the lake. Hippo normally spend the whole day up to their eyeballs in water or mud. Their sensitive skin is prone to sunburn and extreme water loss during prolonged exposure to air. They usually graze at night, returning frequently to wallows to prevent dehydration. But at Kariba, lush grasses are never far from water, and even during the day, hippos make short forays out of the water for a snack. Hippos are notoriously short-tempered and territorial, but here, people are so rare, they evoke only mild curiosity and a warning stare. The lake and its wildlife are attracting tourists, although not yet as many as the more established safari destinations in Kenya and Tanzania. Coming late to the tourist game, Zimbabwe has managed to avoid many mistakes. Sites for the lodges are chosen with great sensitivity to the wildlife. One complex is actually floating on the lake. Tours operate in a manner that does not disturb the landscape or the wildlife, and visitors are often rewarded by seeing animals behaving in a fearless fashion that's increasingly rare in overpopulated Africa. Sometimes a quiet tour gets a glimpse of one of Africa's great hunters. Kariba has a thriving population of leopards, and these elegant big cats can occasionally be seen on the prowl even in daylight. Tourists seldom see leopards because they're night hunters. This is truly a special appearance. The most outstanding success story is that of the crocodile. 
They were almost completely wiped out at Kariba to protect the thousands of men employed to build the dam. But crocodiles, while dangerous, are also a fragile species. Once their numbers fall below a certain level, extinction is only a step away. In Zimbabwe, it was decided that draconian control measures required an equally aggressive recovery strategy. Farms were set up to breed crocodiles to restock the wild. These are now so successful, an excess is produced that has started to earn the country much needed foreign currency. The value put on certain animal products, such as crocodile handbags, has produced ecological and economic benefits to Zimbabwe. Populations of these farmed animals are increasing. Zimbabwe has found that good ecology results in substantial economic returns. But the economic value that is ensuring survival for some wildlife is tragically pushing the rhino closer and closer to extinction. The exorbitant price commanded by the horn in the Orient for folk medicine and in North Yemen for ceremonial dagger handles, has made poaching irresistibly profitable. In Kenya, where there were several thousand black rhinos just 10 years ago, the population is probably now about 300. Poaching has decimated herd after herd, sweeping south down the continent. Here, near the Great Lake, is the last wild breeding herd of black rhino on Earth. They are the target of highly organized, internationally backed teams of poachers from Zambia, crossing into Zimbabwe at narrow points like the Chetty Gorge. Zimbabwe has declared war on these poachers with a shoot-to-kill policy and efficient patrols that are finally achieving some success. The number of poachers has not declined, but the number of rhino killed has started to come down. As a hedge against poaching, hundreds of rhino have been translocated away from the border. For the moment, tragic though the circumstances may be, this creature makes the Zambezi Valley an extra special place. The last stand for the wild rhino of Africa. Another concern all over Africa is the declining populations of elephants, also the victims of poachers seeking tusks for the ivory trade. Zimbabwe's well-protected herd of elephant is large and thriving, kept in balance by culling the excess.
This elephant management, as culling is more delicately known, is controversial, but serves two purposes. Elephants protected in sanctuaries tend to overpopulate and destroy their habitat, especially trees that provide their food. This animal is shaking down nutritious seed pods. In Zimbabwe, the excess population is shot in carefully controlled quotas that are assessed each year according to habitat damage. There is a booming industry in skin products as well as ivory, and the dried meat is an important source of protein to the local people. No part of the animal is wasted. All this earns vital foreign currency for the government. For the moment, it is working in Zimbabwe. Here at Kariba and elsewhere in the valley, elephant populations and the forests are held in healthy balance. But in the rest of Africa, poaching has decimated unprotected herds and there is no excess population. In Kenya, the national herd, numbering more than 150,000 elephants only a decade ago, has been reduced to less than 20,000. Safe for the moment here at Kariba, elephants enjoy the water. In preference to browsing in the trees, these animals regularly wade into the lake and harvest submerged green grass. It's said that elephants never forget. From the very beginning of the formation of the lake, stories have been told of elephants continuing to follow their age-old land routes long after they were flooded. Today, processions of elephants calmly marching through the water on some unknown business, provide some of Kariba's best wildlife viewing. Sadly, there are few places left on Earth that can still claim to be paradise for animals. Vast, underpopulated Kariba is one of them. At first glance, this is also one of the few unblemished development stories in Africa. Whatever damage was done here, man and nature have restored a balance. Even the great curving wall of the dam has achieved a certain dramatic grandeur. It's an Eden for wildlife, but one serious problem remains. Displaced by the lake 30 years ago, the Batanka people and others like them are still struggling to earn a meager living in areas with poor soils and low rainfall. Until recently, they have had little to gain from the wealth of wildlife Zimbabwe is fostering. The wildlife competes for their marginal land and destroys communal crops. These people have found no advantage in Kariba. It destroyed their god, and now it has been given over to animals and tourists. In a country where the government owns the wildlife, there have been no mechanisms by which rural communities could earn direct income from wildlife resources. And where local communities do not participate in management and decision-making processes, they have no direct stake in conservation. Zimbabwe has decided to tackle this problem, and in the process, perhaps to write a conservation blueprint for the whole of Africa. In a program called Campfire, developed by the Department of National Parks and Wildlife, this whole region and its people are being prepared for a new relationship. Traditional government distributions of revenue from hunting and the sale of wildlife products is too remote and unattached from the events on the land. 
new rules regarding communal rights to local resources are being forged. Zimbabwe has realized that the cultivation of wildlife on these lands will have a greater economic return for these people than any other land use. The campfire program will hand over the responsibility and profits of wildlife management directly to local communities. It's hoped that this responsibility will empower the rural people of Zimbabwe to achieve a new stewardship over their land. On a continent where the reality of overpopulation threatens to degrade the land and its wildlife, Zimbabwe has launched an experiment that could reverse the decline of wild animals in Africa. The commitment to wildlife, demonstrated during Operation Noah at Kariba 30 years ago, has been rekindled by campfire as a promise for the future. If campfire fails, all this has no more substance than mythical Shangri-La. Dan Small goes spring bird watching at the Ware Nature Center tonight on Outdoor Wisconsin Net on Channel 10.